I learned very well that the, you can't shove tough things down people's throats. They're not going to listen. They're just going to like gag it up. If you do it with humor, then it's going to make a tough topic a lot less scary, a lot more palatable, and you'll keep coming back for more. You gotta pick yourself up, go backwards, and slam yourself at the wall like 500 more times until the wall crumbles. 25% of middle school girls already believe they'll never achieve their dream career. Dream career. Hi, I'm Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint. Hint. And you're Hint. listening to Unstoppable, a podcast spotlighting the journeys of inspiring entrepreneurs. I believe that at its core, leadership is about constantly learning from the people around you. And I'm so inspired by the conversations we're having in our upcoming episodes and can't wait to share them with you. This season, some of my guests include Andrew Dudham, founder of Hims, Erica Nardini, CEO of Barstool Sports, Daniel Dubois and Whitney Tingle, co-founders of Sakara Life, and much, much more. Plus, we asked the million dollar question, what does it really take to be unstoppable? Stoppable. Let's find out. Hi, everybody. It's Kara Golden, and we're here with Unstoppable, and so excited this morning to have Rebecca Soper with us. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you so much for having me. This is the highlight of my day. Yay. <laughs> so Rebecca and I are on a wonderful community called The List Together. And a uh, shout out to Rachel Sklar. For, we love you, Rach. Yeah, for <laughs> creating this great thing with Glennis as well. And really, really excited. So we've talked many times through email and probably through phone, but we've actually never gotten together face to face. So we're <laughs> sort of like... Really, really excited about that too, but that's a whole other story. So we're here this morning to really get some more information on this great company that Rebecca has started called Modern Loss, uh, but also going to talk about her book a little bit, which I have here as well, and so great. So uh, just a little bit about Rebecca. So she started this company in 2013. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I was With, nine months pregnant. Oh, I, I love the pregnant uh, business plan, yeah. right? And yeah, very wise. Yes, I did that as well. So uh, in starting hands, I was pregnant with my fourth, actually, when that whole thing started. You win. Uh, well, no, but it's uh, it's all good. And then uh, with Gabby Berkner, so she co-founded Modern Loss. And uh, it's not just a website, but I really do believe it's a movement, and especially around a life stage that I think everybody goes through. Mm -hmm. And so we're here to talk to her more about that. And prior to that, she was doing lots of cool stuff, including one that I did not realize. Mm -hmm. She was working with Stephen Colbert. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll maybe get sort of fun things that <laughs> the most fun stuff that you remember from those days as well. But anyway, welcome. So talk to me a little bit about how this all started. Yeah, um, well, it is very safe to say that this was not what I thought I'd be doing in life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also safe to say that if I were presented with the option to do this, I would have probably said, no, nah, I'm good. Because my goal was to, you know, I went to Columbia Journalism School. Uh, as you just mentioned, I worked for Stephen Colbert. I was a producer at the Colbert Report when it first started. And I wanted to do political satire. I wanted to do, you know, media that mattered. In, in, in the way in which I felt it mattered. Mm -hmm. And I was very excited to grow in that role, grow in that, you know, type of, of content. But as we all know, the joke is perpetually on us in life and we make our plans and the universe says, okay, that's cute. Mm -hmm. And what happened with me was I, it was 2006, Labor Day. I just finished a camping trip with my parents in upstate New York, where it's like the, the, the most favorite, my, my most favorite place in the universe. It's called Lake George. We camp on the middle of this gorgeous lake on an island. And it was the place where I always reconnected with them every year. And especially when I was 30, you know, life was changing so much. I had just got my graduate degree and I was starting this new job, which was crazy. And it was just a meaningful trip that we had. And at the end of that night, they dropped me back off at my apartment. I said a very quick, but very comfortable, like no big deal goodbye. And 45 minutes later, I got a phone call that there had been a terrible accident on the New Jersey Turnpike and my mom was not okay. And, you know, I could talk forever about that night, even though I try not to remember it so much. But 
I learned as soon as I got to the hospital that she hadn't survived. She was she was killed in the in the accident. My dad was in the car with her, and that was my entry point into, you know, really my version of adulthood because I'd realized that I'd kind of been a kid up until then. I, I just turned 30, but I felt like I was like 19. Also being a single woman living in New York, you know, yeah. in my little apartment with my college era furniture still. Um, and so I became very quickly aware of how isolating it is to live with profound grief or even semi-profound grief, yeah. how our culture does not want to talk about this kind of stuff, how the pressure is always on us to make everybody else in the room feel comfortable. And, you know, honestly, it was especially hard because I was 30. I was working full time. I was still building up a role at a newish place for me. Yeah. And I didn't have a structure, and you and I were talking about this before we started recording, of I couldn't look at the employee handbook and say, okay, oh, I can take like two months off in pieces if your mom is violently killed. You know, I, I know I have someone to catch me at work. I actually didn't because there was no bereavement policy. It was up to my managers how many days I got off. There was nothing that was like really written. And then moving forward, I still had to pay my rent. I still had to work. I had to advocate for myself while navigating, also building up my life. I was very much in my build phase of life. And so all of that was just like really isolating, really excruciating and really lonely because I also really wanted to hear from someone that I could still live a really good life in spite of this hand that I had been dealt. Like I didn't want it to be all over at age 30, but it felt like it because I felt so alone. And so Modern Loss really came out of that experience, which was my mom dying and then unfortunately my dad dying just a few years later. So I was 34, both my parents were dead, absolutely not my life plan. And it just kept occurring to me over and over again, okay, this is just, I'm so sick of this stigma. I'm sick of this being a stigma. Why can we talk about everything else in the world, but not grief? It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so I pulled in my friend, Gabby Berkner, and we launched in 2013, so 2013, um, November, 2013. As I mentioned, I was nine months pregnant. She was about six months pregnant. So a very wise move on our parts. Um, and it's in essence, a digital platform, an online publication that runs literary nonfiction, um, personal essays, so many that are narrowly focused around one aspect of the grief experience and loss like at any point in time, like one day after, 20 years after, just to prove that this has a long tail, that it's with you 365 24 seven, and that we're there for you. Like we're your resource, we're your community outside of your therapy circles, outside of, you know, any religious circles you might be a part of. Like, this is just your storytelling platform where you can let it all hang out with no judgments. So that's, you know, that's what it came out of. Again, not my plan, nor would it have been my choice, but, you know, life gives you this hand and you say, well, sometimes it is what it is. What can I do about it yeah, to stay sane? you're saying. navigating it and you're, you know, and absolutely. And I know you can help others as you're starting. You've already been through something that people are maybe unfortunately just going through. Yeah, that was it. it that's the, yeah. that's huge. It's not like I, my mom died and then I said, I want to start a platform. Yeah. That's like, I was very insular. I was very insular. I, I went through living hell for a few years. I didn't want to, you know, this was not what I thought I would be doing. I waited until I was ready for this to be something that I knew how to do as an editor, a publisher, a producer, you know, yeah. and also. So someone who, you know, as one of the leads of it, knew what type of content needed to be a part of it because I was also moving through it. So what do you think is like the consistent, is there a consistent thread? Like what, like, yeah. like when people go through this horror, right? Like what is that kind of consistent thing that you hear that people like really are sort of needing? Yeah. Anything else? I think that they need to have it made clear to them that they have permission to talk about what they're going through and that 
th- there's no pressure for them to have it be in like hushed tones or like any fear that the record is going to come to a screeching halt if they mention a dead partner or a miscarriage. Um, these things happen. They happen to people we love every single day. We might not even know it because they're not talking about it. And I, we keep hearing that there's just this, this encouraging silence that is suggested to keep it to safe corners, like keep it to like, you know, therapy or really close friends. What we want to do is make it something that can live out loud in the open and be something that can be dropped into conversation and then dropped out of conversation. Because when you talk about your loss, you know, if you say my dead mom, that's really overwhelming to many people in the modern loss community to the, the thought of saying that out loud to a coworker, to a manager, but we're encouraging them to say it so that it becomes normalized Mm -hmm. so that they can in the same sentence or same two sentences, speaking with a friend or someone at the water cooler, then talk about a work deadline or a date that they had. We want to normalize this. And that is what the biggest desire is from our community is just feeling normal, feeling like there's nothing wrong with them, like they aren't damaged goods, Mm -hmm. feeling like they're not part of a taboo. That is really, I mean, that's like a meta thing. Um, Definitely most of our readers are between the 20s and 40s, if not, you know, early 50s age range, you know, a really younger audience. Again, I was 30 when my mom died. Gabby was in her 20s when her dad and her stepmom were killed. Um, And so this really came out of this realization that we're in this unique stage of life where we have to build up our lives, but we're also faced with loss. And we felt like there was a white space that existed that really needed to be filled with regard to that. So inherently, a lot of our younger our reader and going, our readers are younger and going through the same thing. And a lot of times, work comes up. How do I talk to my boss? How do I get support at work? Um, I don't. I'm, you know, I'm exhausted from, you know, two years of caretaking. Yeah. But my mom just died, or my husband is 30 and just dropped dead from a brain aneurysm. I have two little kids. How am I going to do this? Like, how do I ask for support? So asking for support from friends and family and especially workplace is definitely something that pops up every single day in Modern Last Chatter. People just don't know how to do that. Like, I mean, it's... No, and we we don't make it easy for them in this country. I mean, this country doesn't really seem... I mean, I think it seems to like pregnant women, but, you know, as a mother of two little kids in Manhattan, sometimes I feel like it doesn't like mothers or or kids. You know, life is is hard. You know, there's not a lot of structures in place to catch you and to say it's okay. And I feel like loss, those who live with loss which newsflash is going to be every single person you ever meet in life, you know, that's another group that really needs support, ongoing support. And it shouldn't be something that's stigmatized. Um, but in, in in our workplace, you know, we were just talking about it. The average bereavement leave policy, I think, is like three days. Mm-hmm. And that's for a that's for a parent or a child, three days. That's insane. Yeah. And I know there are companies that are doing better. And that's great, but I, that's like the sheer minority of companies, and we need to do better. Absolutely. No, I think it's it's super important. Do you see a gender like difference in, in kind of how people talk about this as well? I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We actually ran a piece... Um, I don't know, a few months ago, and I called it Dude, Where's My Grief? Mm -hmm. Because it was written by a clinical psychologist, a a, a dude, (laughs) whose mom had died when he was in college. And he was so, you know, utterly transformed by the experience that he became a therapist who specializes in, in grief and runs grief groups for men between the ages of like 18 and 34, because that's a segment that just, you know, A, they're not used to people dying around them. And B, dudes just don't, you know, men don't, they don't process grief in the same way that women do for the most part. And I'm, you know, generalizing, but I'm generalizing for a reason, you know, they're much more internal. And, you know, I'm not a therapist, but I've learned this, we're working with many therapists over the last six years, um, they're much more internalized. They'll they'll go insular. They'll fix their car or become fixated on a project. They're not going to sit down and say, you know, I really just need to emote. Can we just like hold hand? I need a hug. Like I need yeah. a touch. 
for the most part, that's not what they do. And so I think it's extra difficult for people who are in relationships, you know, the people who um, have had miscarriages, had stillbirths, or, a per, you know, a relationship where the father, the, the man has lost somebody. Everybody has their own grief journey. And sometimes the journeys are so incredibly disparate that you really need to work to see each other. And so what we do at Modern Loss is try to peel back and, and kind of show the underbelly of the grief experience, like what's really going on behind, you know, in, in, in a man's brain when he's when grieving, what's really going on, you know, when you have a stillbirth, what, what really happens? Like, what does it really feel like to go through that experience? Because we want everybody to become more empathic and so that the next person that goes through it, they really know how to support them. And that is how I really feel like we change a culture. That's how I feel we really move the needle. I feel like I'm friends with a lot of guys who have shared with me privately mm -hmm. and not so much out in the open that they've had a miscarriage, their wife's mm -hmm. had a miscarriage. And I think it's, it's so fascinating because I'm always like to see them grieving and they don't feel like they're allowed to actually talk about this mm -hmm. in their typical, you know, circles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that what my advice to them is that they're actually going home to the situation where, you know, they're kind of in this denial, like they don't really talk about it and then they go home and, and that even creates more issues, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Of how, you know, are you communicating with this? So even if, you know, the, the person who's actually experienced the, you know, miscarriage is if her community is not talking about it, then, you know, I don't think it helps her. Right. No, then nobody's going talking about it. Because yeah. She have to talk to yeah. about it. Yeah. And I really think that it's like, it, it extends way beyond that. And that's thing? one in four, yeah. one in four yeah. women it's crazy. will experience a miscarriage. Yeah. And I, I guarantee you that there are multiple women in this, you know, on this floor in which we're speaking who have gone through this. Um, it's just still called the silent sorrow. And what we've worked really hard on for six years nonstop is to really destigmatize those like taboos times two, which grief is a stigma, sure, loss is stigma, even like 10 years after you lose someone. People don't really want to hear about it. But you're still living with loss. You know, you're living with a different version of loss. You know, like I have two little kids. I wasn't parenting through loss when my mom died. I was a single person trying to figure out how to have a dead mom in the world. And now I'm a woman who's married, who has two little kids who don't get to have living grandparents. So I have to deal with that every day and figure out how to navigate that. So what we try to show is that this isn't just that first 365 day period of time. Like modern loss is literally a lifestyle movement. It's an endeavor that, you know, people are really happy in our community. Yeah. They're not just like, they didn't just lose someone yesterday, but they do need the ongoing support and the ongoing invitation to have a conversation about this stuff because things keep popping up. And so we always try to shine a light on the losses that are extra difficult to talk about. Like you say, miscarriage, stillbirth, suicide, AIDS related illness, you know, there are so many different types of death that people just like you hear crickets in the air yeah. when it's mentioned and you think about the, the survivors of those yeah. deaths and of those losses yeah. and what happens to them and how marginalized they feel. And it's like your heart breaks, yeah. you know, we live in this community and um, just north of San Francisco called Marin County. Oh, and it's amazing oh how God. many grandparents have moved in to this community mm -hmm. who are, you know, the parents, I say grandparents because there's so many kids in this community, but are the parents of, you know, many of my friends. And, you know, and they pass away. Yeah. And like these grandparents have made a conscious decision to sort of be in their kids' lives. Mm -hmm. And so they, you see them walking to school and you're like, oh, that's Derek's parents and that's this. And what I see so often is like, that's a whole other set where like on the one hand, these are the parents of, you know, the friends in the community, but it's also the grandparents who, you know, in many ways, while the parents are off working, 
are right. there, they're raised, right? Yeah. And they're raising, yeah. I mean, they're yeah. not raising these kids. No, they're but they're, they're a really big presence in their lives. Super yeah. big presence. They're not just like a yeah. Boca Raton visit no. on spring break. And they, and they have made this conscious decision. And so I'm always like, I'm curious if you're seeing that mm-hmm. as well. Like, how do you, like, I think that it's generational yeah. too, and how people are reacting to that. And I think also... Um, you know, I would say even that there's some situations where it's like, I don't, for a kid, they don't want to talk too much in their house because it upsets their parents and they, they know they're upset. But then on the other hand, they need, you know, someone to support them mm-hmm. as well. Do you see that community like in your conversations where people are concerned about, you know, their kids as well? Like it's not. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, they're... yeah, absolutely. So again, many of our readers, many of our community members are you know, younger generation, they're millennials, Gen Xers, maybe Gen Z at this point. Um, And and so they have kids. I mean, I have kids. I'm in this community. And, um, you know, I always say, wow, (laughs) I would give anything to have my parents living, but I'm really glad I don't have to go through that again because that was really excruciating. And I look at my friends whose parents are getting older while they're dropping their kids off at preschool and then going to their all day meetings or going to trial or doing whatever business deals they're doing or going to operate on someone. And I think, wow, that's really complicated because a lot of them do have parental support. Um, And I'm very envious of that, to be honest. I wish I had that, but it also must be really complex because those parents are the older parents eventually are going to die that's just what happens it's part of life and they're going to be thank goodness and that's a good thing that the grandparents are going to be such a presence in the kids lives i feel like in these days these days we are having more of that and that's a wonderful thing but of course that's more loss that's more profound loss that kids are going to experience we always have parents in the community we have closed facebook groups we have you know we're on all the social media platforms so there's a lot of chatter there's a lot of peer-to-peer support a lot and a lot of in-person events where i hear this happening and you know people are worried about their kids that someone loses a partner a husband or even another child oh my god i'm so worried about my child what do i do so modern loss is definitely not a platform for children because again, I'm not a therapist. I'm a, a producer, yeah. a journalist, a storyteller. But those children have parents, and the parents are part of the community. Yeah. And so we have many, many, many pieces, many resources, many essays, and prescriptive pieces about how to help kids who are grieving. And one of my favorite ones is I think it's called like Six Reasons Why You Should Focus on a Grieving Child, because just like men, Grieving kids look different than a grieving 35-year-old woman. They don't express it the same way. They are not developmentally there. They have different stages every single year with, you know, with regard to what they can handle, what they can process and how they can externalize it. And so we really try and hold parents' hands through the process, through, you know, going through a lot of advisors who are licensed therapists, and also running essays by people who are in it to share what works for them, what is the mess for them, what's unresolved for them. There's no resolution here. It's just part of this journey that never ends. But we're not going to pull each other through it unless we can divide up this load among all of us. And then the load feels a little lighter. When you feel like you're part of a community, at any point, even if it's like, you know, part of the same baseball team, yeah. you feel it better. That's really what ends up. I mean, I look at even, you know, the, the hint community. I mean, people have said for, for years there were these drinks that were like, you know, doctors recommend it. Mm-hmm, at the end mm-hmm. of the day, mm-hmm. like people want to say that that kind of stuff, like, and I think it's the same for you, is like a good thing. Like mm-hmm. doctors say this. Right, but at the right. End of the day, it's the people that are in it that right. are actually getting results from mm-hmm. these stories, people who are, yeah. you know, drinking water or hint and, and they're getting the results, right? You need to hear those stories. So I think what you guys are doing is like so spot on. It's even more important than, you know, and how many of these people where, you know, this happens to them actually go to, you know, a doctor individually because they're like, I don't need to go to the doctor. This happens to everybody, but how they're how do how they're processing it and mm-hmm. how they're ultimately able to go on? Mm-hmm. I think is just like looking at other people and hearing their. Stories. It's it. I mean, that's what I, what I needed when I was thirty 
and had to work at a daily TV show every day and come home at eight o'clock at night. You know, this was a grueling schedule and, and also have a dead mom and then a living dad back in Philly who I would go see every weekend. I was stretching myself so thin. I was like, you know, one little pat of butter that was spread across like an enormous baguette. I felt like I was going to crack. What I needed was not people putting their hands on my shoulders and vomiting platitudes onto me. Like it takes a year or like, you know, it'll get better. It'll be okay. And I was like, okay. Like I, I used obscenities to myself and said, I, okay, I, I don't want to hear that it's going to bleeping be okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to know how. If you can't draw me a roadmap, then please don't tell me this empty shit yeah. because, sorry, can I say that? Yeah, okay. Say that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, please don't give this to me. It's not helpful. In fact, it's actually infuriating me and I kind of want to hit you. Um, what I needed were stories. I'm a storyteller. I wanted to, to be shown, not told. Yeah. And that is what Modern Loss is. We show you through people's experiences what it feels like. We show you through people's experiences what worked for them, not in general, the silver bullet thing that worked for them that doesn't exist, but like the thing that they're grappling with on a narrow focus, you know, how did they deal with the decision to have or not have another child after their second child died? You know, how did they come to that decision, whatever it was? Maybe it helps you think about how you're going to do it. How did they decide to completely jump careers after their mom was killed because life is freaking short. You know, our pieces are meant to be both used for commiseration purposes, but mostly for inspiration. This is very inspirational endeavor. This is not just like, let's all suck our thumbs and talk about how crappy this is. I mean, it totally is. But it's also like, if you make the decision to stick around after somebody dies, and many of us do have to make that decision, then we owe it to ourselves to live as well as humanly possible. And that's what we want to help you do. So Modern Loss, the the book. Yeah. Have you guys so excited. I wish you could see this here. Uh, but it's definitely pretty. go. It's on Amazon <laughs> uh, at, at uh, Modern Loss. How does this differ? Yes. In sort of what you've been doing. Today? That's a good question. Um, so our book came out last year in 2018, and it's called Modern Loss, Candid Conversation About Grief, Beginner's Welcome. And it is a collection of pieces. It is purposely meant, I mean, you're holding it in your hand. I would say it's very pretty. It's very bright. It's very cheerful. It's not what you would think. You know, it doesn't look like a chicken soup book. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like, totally. you know, the stages of grief, like, wah, wah, let's use it as a doorstop. It yeah. is purposely meant to look like something that you think is cool enough to leave on your coffee table and leave it out loud and be unabashed about it. I'm not embarrassed to have a book about grief in your home. Don't shove it under the bed. You know, it's kind of a metaphor for how we want you to approach this topic. Mm -hmm. And it is a collection of about 45 pieces. And Gabby and I wrote extensively for it. And each piece has its own cartoon. We hired this amazing New York New Yorker cartoonist, Peter Arkel. He's terrific. Um, and then we have all these, these individual cartoons that are pieces in there, uh, you know, in and of themselves that have prescriptive advice. Um, we have uh, a piece called Grief Speak, which was a full page excerpt in the New York Times, which is kind of like this loose lexicon about real terms of yeah, loss that, that like yeah. therapists definitely don't use, but I definitely do. Um, and as I mentioned, I wrote a lot for it. So did Gabby, but so did 40 people from around the world. So we have five continents represented in this book, which is insane. And I wish I could say one was Antarctica, but it's not. Um, but the book is divided among umbrella experiences that we loosely define, like triggers, absence plus time, mm -hmm. journeys, secrets, collateral damage, which is like all the insulting crap you have to deal with after a death that you, you know, when you think the world should really just kind of do you a yeah. solid and lay off for a little bit. I could bit. write a book on that. Topic. Yeah, totally. And yeah. so all these, these chapters each have about four or five different pieces. Some of them are by people that are, you know, public names like Amanda Palmer, who's a, yeah. a literal rock star. Amazing. Brian Stelter, who hosts Reliable Sources on CNN, um, Kim Goldman, who is kind of infamous from her brother Ron Goldman, mm -hmm. was one of the victims in yeah. you know, 
the Nicole Brown Simpson murder trial. And, um, you know, some are just people who have really, really compelling voices and stories that have to be told. That's amazing. Where they That's don't it. normally get the platform to tell those stories. And it's meant to be picked up and then it's meant to be put down for like three months if you need to. But it's meant to be there. That's awesome. That's so great. So tell us, like, what's next for Modern Loss? Well, um, <laughs> so I do, I personally do a lot of live storytelling events, which I love doing. I just did one at the JCC Manhattan. We sold out with 230 people. I want to have you to San Francisco. I would, I, office. I would love that. There. That'd be amazing. They're really great. And so I, because I believe that this topic really needs to be approached with a dose of levity whenever possible, given my background mm -hmm. in political satire, I learned very well that the, you can't shove tough things down people's throats. They're not going to listen. They're just going to like gag it up. Mm -hmm. If you do it with humor, then it's going to make a tough topic a lot less scary, a lot more palatable, and you'll keep coming back for more because you're not going to be like terrified. Yeah. So that's what modern, that's our tone in modern loss. It's light. It's not disrespectful, but it's light. I don't, I have no problem with gallows humor. It has saved my sanity on many an occasion and it saves a lot of people's sanity. And sometimes what more do you have, but the ability to just laugh at the ludicrous aspect of this whole mess. And so these storytelling events, I put together a lineup of comedians and performers and writers, and it's a very curated show where we have five or six people sharing like five or six minute stories about an aspect of their loss and their body. Like you could be in the basement of Second, Second City or UCB or Comedy Cellar, and instead you're at the JCC listening to this. And um it's like my favorite, you know, the last of uh, my last closer in March was Katie Rich, who writes Weekend Update for Saturday Night Live. So I love doing those events. I'm very hopeful that there will be more. I'd like to do more of them around the country. Yeah, um, have you to San Francisco yeah that would be great. Space, yeah. Great. And we have a partnership with 1-800-Flowers. Mm -hmm. We do some content for them. I did a live event with them, a pre-holiday self-care event, which was so great. Last week, we built her own terrariums. I know that sounds really silly, but honestly, I love building my own terrarium. It was really fun. And we had wine and cheese and community and people who are just kind of bracing themselves for this, you know, ho ho, like it's such a, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Like it's actually not for a lot of people, even if you're years down the line, it's bittersweet. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to recognize the bitterness in this. So I like doing events that are kind of focused around those holidays. I'm in the middle of finishing up our winter holiday gift swap, where we ask anybody who thinks that the holiday season is a trigger for them with regard to a loss to sign up. And then we match them with a complete stranger around the country or in Canada. I love it. And so now I have matched personally more than 1,200 people over the last three years That's with amazing. each other who send each other gifts and cards. So we do a lot of wacky things. A lot of it is like boiling a big pot of pasta and throwing it against the wall and seeing what sticks. But I know it sounds crazy to describe it like this. It's fun because when people ask me, how do I do you work with death every day? Like, I don't view it as working with death. I actually view it very much as working with life and working with the people who are trying to live well. Right. And you're, and you're looking at the future. Yeah. And how do you, you know, because I think that's so hard for so many people. It's so hard. Having lost both of my parents, I think it's, it's, uh, I get it. And it was, uh, you know, when I, as you and I shared earlier before, it's something that you can go through and you can sort of say, here's what my experience was, but everybody's experience is different. And so I think mm -hmm. more stories in there mm -hmm. for people to gauge, you know, pick pieces yeah. of, you know, what... You, it's a choose is. your own inspirational okay. adventure. Right. Yeah. There's no... If I want to leave you, you know, or your listeners with any one thought, there is no right way to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, the, there, there's one wrong way, which is if you're hurting yourself, you're hurting somebody else. Anything else beyond that goes. Why shouldn't it? Who cares? Yeah. You do you. Who cares? No, you know? absolutely. <laughs> I think it's it's so true. So uh, I always ask this question, what makes Ooh. you unstoppable? <laughs> and I think you've answered a lot. Coffee? Yeah. Coffee, <laughs> hints, you know. Terror? Right? I don't right. know. Exactly. <laughs> um, Fear of being late for school pickup? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, putting this different lens on 
on death. And mm-hmm. I always, you know, appreciate companies uh, that are helping people. Thank like I you. Get there's a lot of people and, and, you know, that as they talk about your brand, you're actually helping people, which I think is something so powerful. And, you know, that's, but I, yeah, I mean, I, I really like to think so. I think, you know, in all seriousness, you ask me what makes me unstoppable. And the real answer with regard to modern loss is that I, I 1 million percent believe in this. Mm-hmm. I completely drank the Kool-Aid, mostly because I started making the Kool-Aid myself. Oh. And I was just sick of the stigma. I was sick of the crickets. And I was like, this is just no way to live life. I don't understand. Maybe something's wrong with me that I'm happy to talk about this stuff. And, you know, but, but other people probably want to as well. And so that's what makes me unstoppable because I really believe it and I'm really driven. I'm really passionate about this. And I want to do more retreats. I, I've done two retreats at Kripalu. I have been doing a lot of public speaking. I'd like to do more of that in 2020, speak with companies, go into their HR departments, their employee wellness programs, talk about community building and peer-to-peer support. Um, Because when you have people who talk to you about that stuff, I think it makes you a much happier or at least more loyal employee you feel taken care of. So yeah, that's what makes me unstoppable and coffee. I love it. So what's your favorite hint flavor? Oh my gosh! <laughs> I mean, I mean, you actually served it to me. Yeah, yeah. I do like. I do like. The the, I do like the sparkling hint. Yeah, I do. We have a seltzer problem in my house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like sometimes I ask my husband if he's capable of of, of drinking still it. water. Yeah. Um, but as I said, hint has a very special place in in my life with my husband. We met at a benefit um, that we were pulled into the planning committee for that benefit the next year because they were so excited that two people met there and ended up together. And Hint was one of the sponsors. So, and Hint was a sponsor of our Modern Loss launch. And I remember we had barely known each other and I think I had enough chutzpah because I was like nine months pregnant and my OB said, you're four centimeters dilated. And I said, shit, I think we have to launch because that's like, good, it's going to get really busy. And I emailed you. I said, I think we're going to have a little party. Is there any way you could send yeah. some boxes? And you were like, yep, it's done. So it was like an open bar and hint. I'm loyal. I'm a lifelong loyal yeah, hint so, lady. That's so great. <laughs> okay. So Rebecca Sofer on, it's on Twitter. It's just at Rebecca Sofer, S-O-F-F-E-R, on Twitter, on Instagram. Modern Loss is very active on all social platforms. Um, You know, we're at Modern Loss everywhere. And we do have a Patreon campaign that is really going to be the thing that I hope helps us keep the movement going. Uh, We encourage anybody, anybody, if you find value in what we are doing here, if you find value in this community, in this conversation, if you have seen somebody in isolation going through loss and want there to be a better conversation about it and resources and content, then help me be part of the the reason that this movement keeps going and become a member of Modern Loss on Patreon. And each level has its own benefits. It's super easy. You can choose your own. So yeah, you can you can find us in the ether and. Um, In person, you can find me running around New York City. So thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. If you like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? please talk to me at Kara Golden on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be unstoppable. Unstoppable. unstoppable.